Grace and peace are always for you. To God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, amen. I think all of you know that my dad was a preacher also. And uh, when I was a boy, sometimes about three or four times a year, he would travel as an evangelist. And he would go to some other community, some other church, and preach a series of special meetings. And while he was away, of course, the little boy misses his daddy. And I remember that when the day came where, where dad was due home, and I knew that it was close to the time, I would just go sit on the curb close to where my house was and wait for my dad. And when that big 56 Chevy would come around the corner, I would get up and I'd be pumping my arms. And when he pulled in the driveway, I'd run up to when he opened the door and give my dad a hug. Because dad was home. And when dad came home, our home was a home. Help me fill out these sentences. How do you make a house a home? What would you say? Love. Love makes a house a home. Home is where you're... So where does God live? That's what I want to chase around with you for a few minutes. Where does God live? And I want you to see with me through the Scriptures a progression of the intentionality of God because He wants to be in a relationship with you and me. Would you say that God is at home in your home? Would you say that God is at home here at Faith Lutheran? And what would make God comfortable to make a place his home. Where is God? Wouldn't we say he's everywhere? That is true. God, by his spirit, is everywhere. Do you remember when David told God that he was going to build him a house, a temple? And in 2 Samuel 7, it says that he sent Samuel to David to say, You will not build me a house, but I will build you a house. Meaning a lineage of sons who would reign as king in relationship to me as God. Another place in the scripture it says, God doesn't dwell in a temple made with hands, human hands. In other words, we cannot limit where God would live. He lives everywhere. But during the time where God's people, under the leadership of Moses, were freed from Egypt, from their slavery, and went into the wilderness, God instructed them to build a tabernacle, a tent, a tent of meeting. And there in that tent, it shone, it says in the scriptures, with a Shekinah glory. Have you ever heard that term before? that when God came down and manifested His presence in that tabernacle, it radiated with light. But there was almost a palpable sense of the presence of God to the point where when people would enter the tabernacle, they knew God was there. They felt His presence. In fact, they felt His presence so much that they felt unholy and unclean in the presence of God. That's why the tabernacle was called the tent of meeting, the place where you encountered the presence of God. You'll also remember, of course, that it was a tent. And you who love to camp, what do you do with a tent? You set it up wherever you travel, right? So God was a God on the move. He was not located in one specific place. And how did God's people know where the presence of God was? 
there was by day a pillar of cloud and by night a pillar of fire. And when the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire moved, God's people knew that they needed to move too. Did I tell you that a few weeks back I was grilling some steaks on the lava grill, which, by the way, is on our back deck, which is about three feet from the house. And it's been one or two or ten years since I cleaned the grill. There might have been just a little residue grease there. And the steak had an extra amount of tallow in it so that it would taste good. You know where this is going? So I put the steaks on the grill, and I went in the house to do something else to get ready for supper, and I came back out, and it was like Moses by the burning bush. I mean, the grill was scorched. And Denise and I run out, and she goes, what are you going to do? Can you throw the grill off the deck? (laughs) I'm 10 feet away, and I can feel the heat. She said, go get some water. So she gets, go get this big bowl of water, and I threw it in on the side. And then she went and got another bowl of water, and I crept up and I cracked the grill about that much and threw some more water in there. Thank God the fire went out. And I ate those steaks. The third inch of charcoal on the outside wasn't too bad, but inside it was fine. I'm wondering this. In your journey of life, there are moments where what you have chosen to do or the mistreatment of other people are such that your fire goes out. Or your eyes of faith no longer can see the fire of God's presence in your life. You know what I mean? You don't see where God is. You don't feel Him. It seems like He's abandoned you. And what an empty feeling that is. But I want you to know that when your fire goes out or when you can no longer see or have a sense of the presence of God, God has not left you. And God is, in fact, eager to reveal His presence to you again and again so that faith is reignited within you and your eyes begin to see the evidence, Oh, God, You are here. I just didn't know that. It says in the Scripture in the Old Testament that God is our dwelling place. It says in Joshua 1, when Joshua was asked by God to be the leader of his people and lead the people into the promised land. And he knew that there was going to be giants in the land. And he knew that they were going to face battle after battle after battle. And God said to Joshua, wherever you put the sole of your foot, I have gone before you and I've given you that place. I go before you to prepare the way. So everywhere you and I journey by faith, God goes with you and me. God is with us all the time. We read earlier, you heard earlier from Romans 8, nothing will separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. What a powerful thought. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. So God is our dwelling place. God is our home, but now let's flip it. God who is everywhere now becomes particularly somewhere at Christmas. And one of the names for God in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, it says a virgin shall bear a child and his name will be called Emmanuel, which is God is with us. Now all of a sudden, The God who is everywhere now becomes the God who is specifically somewhere revealing himself to us so that we can know him, so that we can encounter him in a personal way. 
And everything then about what God is doing is continually seeking access to people's lives. That's the nature of the heart of God. That's what love does. Love always seeks the other out and seeks access to share life with them. So we remember the verse in Revelation 3, 20, where it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Because everything about God whose name is Emmanuel is the God wants to seek access to your life so that he could pour his love out to you. And so you would be consciously aware of that and you would trust him. But how did the world receive the Son of God? They rejected him, they condemned him, they beat him up, and they crucified him. Think of it, when Mary was pregnant with Jesus in the womb, there was no room. Remember the scripture verse that says, foxes have holes, birds make their nests, but there's nowhere for the Son of Man to lay his head. Or the verse that Jesus says in John chapter 1, where it says, He came to his own people, but his own people would not receive him. So the world rejected the Son of God. God left everywhere to come somewhere to have a relationship with us, but the world said, No, thank you. You are not welcome here. This is not the way. And because God in Jesus was rejected, he understands when we feel rejected or betrayed. He understands when we suffer. Billy Graham's daughter, Anne, has written a book where she says, when you weep, your tears are on Jesus' face. That's powerful, isn't it? You never suffer alone. Anytime you go through agony or defeat or dis difficulty and you weep because of it, there's such a resonance with the heart of God with you who wants to share the journey with you that your tears are on his face. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are lost, it says in the scripture. Remember in John chapter 6 where it says, Jesus said, the one who comes to me, I'll never turn away. Or in John 1, right after the verse it said, He came to His own and His own rejected Him, it says, But as many as received Him, to them He gave the power to become the children of God. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You open the door, what's God going to do? Where is God? He has come to our world as Emmanuel so that we might open up and share life with him. After he went to the cross and then God vindicated him from raising him from the dead, then God poured out his Holy Spirit. Why? So that the Holy Spirit would inhabit every believer's heart. Now where is God? The one who set the stars in place now is pleased to come and make his home within your heart. There's a very short phrase in Psalm 22, verse 4. I love it, though. It says, God inhabits the praises of his people. Have you ever heard that before? Let it ring inside of you now. God inhabits or indwells or makes his home in the praises of of God's people. Another translation says, God is enthroned on the praises of His people. That means that when you and I come together and we worship and we offer God our praise and we acknowledge the truth that God is awesome and we are grateful for all He's done for us in blessing, that God somehow takes up residence in our hearts that are united in a praise to Him who is our God. 
he inhabit the praises of his people. But then in the passage we read out of Ephesians 2, it says that we are stones fit together. And that as we're fit together, the Holy Spirit of God comes to dwell among us and that God makes his home among us. In 1 Peter it says that we are living stones built together in a tap in a temple for God to dwell. And what happens in the temple? The people who gather worship. So you and I are bonded together. We're bonded together. Even Franz from Haiti comes north and he worships with us and we're bonded together as God's people. And the Spirit dwells among us. And God makes his home among us. This week I read a story by Max Lucado in his book, The Great House of God, where he says, when I was seven years old, I decided I'd had enough of the rules of my father. I decided I didn't need a father. So after an argument with my dad, Lucado writes, I put my clothes in a paper sack and I stormed out the back door and I slammed it and I went down the alley and went a few blocks down the alley until I realized it was supper time, he said. I realized I was hungry. Any of you ever run away when you were a child? He says, in my mind, as I was thinking when I was running away, it was a short-lived rebellion, but it was rebellion nonetheless. He said, if you'd asked me in the middle of my journey down that alley with my clothes in my bag, do you have a father? I'd have said, I don't need a father. I don't need him telling me what to do. I don't need his rules. But he said, if you'd asked my dad, even in my rebellion, if your son says he doesn't need you as his father, is he your son? I have no doubt, he says, what my father's answer would be. Yes, he is my son. So, Lucado says, I came back in that back door that I had stormed out a few minutes before, and I slipped into my place at the supper table across from my father that I had just defied and rebelled against a few minutes before. Did he know that I had run away? Yes. Did he know of the insurrection in my heart, Lucado writes? Yes, he did. Was I still his son? Yes, I was. Here's the truth, Lucado concludes, that the commitment of the Father's heart to love us as his children is always greater than our capacity to faithfully do so. Let me say that again. That the commitment of the Father to us as his children in his love for us is always greater than our capacity to faithfully do so. That's why he is our home. And the Father's love provides a home for us. Let's flip it over. That's why he also in love pursues us as Emmanuel, as Jesus, who went to the cross to bleed out and die, that he might say, your sins are forgiven and I will come and make my home among you. I will dwell with you. And I will be your God and you will be my people. We are the church body of Christ. And as the church, those who believe in our God and give him our praise, we the church are God's home.